Greetings, scholars. I hope you're well. Uh, this is chapter seven, lecture over chapter seven. We'll talk about human memory. Uh, we'll talk about the different processes of memory. Um, so we'll talk about the encoding process. Uh, we'll talk about the storage process, and then we'll also go into um, how do we retrieve memories. And so we'll go through uh, the lecture we broke down in those three sections. And um, there'll be several videos uh, that I won't play um, during this, this recording, uh, but I'll have them listed out um, on the YouTube channel so that you'll have them in the description. If you want to go back and watch some of them, they're really uh, helpful um, when you're trying to kind of understand uh, some of the concepts. So again, I'll put uh, I'll, the links um, to the videos that you'll see. Again, I won't play them um, on here, uh, but I will uh, share those links so you'll have them to, to watch, okay? All right, so human memory. Human memory is one of the, one of the most important pieces of uh, who we are is, uh, is being able to uh, have memory, right? And, and our learning process we talked about in chapter six, human memory, learning, they go uh, and work in tandem, right? If you uh, don't have a good memory, then learning will be really difficult for you. So with learning, um, classical conditioning, operative conditioning, observational learning, you have to be able to remember um, things and have memory of things that you've seen or were taught. And so that's part of it. Um, and we're talking about just the connection between memory and learning, but uh, specifically we'll talk about the processes of uh, memory and how that uh, helps us in the long run, okay? So let's do this. Let me get my, all my stuff together, all right? So here are our objectives. We'll go back. Um, we've got plenty of stuff to cover. We'll talk about, uh, again, the three processes of uh, memory, encoding, uh, storage, and then uh, retrieval. And then there are several things that we'll also discuss um, that, that the intricacies of each part uh, that we'll talk about. Okay. So encoding, um, again, getting information into memory, that is the first part. So we'll talk about that and then we'll move through um, even some issues with memory and how memories can be altered and uh, we could get misinformation to change our memories based on uh, information that we receive after uh, an event or circumstance that happens. Okay, so here are a couple of memory tests. Um, these are logos that are really, really popular in today's society. Um, Google, so it says, which of these is the real Google logo? And uh, I'll, I'll pause it. You can pause the video, um, but you should, if you see Google enough, you should be able to select the right one. Um, again, pause it for, for, your, uh, for your sake. The right one is the correct one, the, the red uh, O, is uh, is before the yellow O. What about this one? This is a pretty easy one, which, which is the real Apple logo. Many of you are already gonna select the right one, which is good. It says, which of these is the real Burger King logo, All right? This one's a little difficult. I mean, they look really, really similar aside from uh, the, the blue arch that, that circles around the, uh, the burger, but you should have selected the right one. We use Instagram almost all the time. And so which one of these is the actual Instagram logo, right? What, how do you remember? Don't look at your phone. Um, look at uh, look at these two logos and tell me which one. you should have selected the left one, okay? So again, very, very simple memory process, but we'll talk about um, how we are able to encode information just like that. Um, and most of being able to remember things like that, especially logos, uh, you have to be able to pay attention to it and you have to be motivated to, to, to be able to remember things like that. Uh, if you do patronize some of those, um, those companies, you know, like Apple and Burger King, um, and if you use Google pretty often, then you might um, be able to see those things if you're paying attention to it. But oftentimes, if you're not paying attention, um, then you're not going to be able to remember it. So we have to be mindful of that when we are uh, trying to remember something. Your focus and your attention is extremely important. So again, these are the three key processes of memory. We'll, we'll focus on these three processes and uh, and then we'll move on to cognition and intelligence uh, in chapter eight, okay? So encoding, storage, and retrieval. Encoding, I like to use the, anal the analogy here. Um, when you're looking at uh, a computer, 
right? So the analogy says when we're talking about information processing, the encoding process is as you are entering data through a keyboard. So you're typing on the keyboard and that is how you're inputting data. That's how you're forming that memory code by encoding it through the keyboard. The storage process is similar to saving data on file on a hard disk, right? So you're maintaining your encoding, your encoded information in memory over time. So you can you can save things and store things for years and years without having to retrieve it, but we know that it's there. The third and last process of memory is retrieval, right? So you're calling up a file and displaying data on the monitor. So I'm able to recall the information and then regurgitate it, right? I'm able to retrieve it and then say it, whatever it is. And, you know, I wanted to know what my mom's number is, cell phone number, I can retrieve it and then present it if I need to, right? Or if I need to remember what someone's face looks like from memory, you can draw it out based on your memory. Um, you can even draw a map of uh, the distance from your home to school, right? Based on certain memory um, that you've created. And we talked about uh, latent learning in, uh, in chapter six, and that cognitive map is based on memory. It's based on how you can remember certain aspects of the environment that you're in. So again, encoding, storage, and retrieval, think of um, the hard drive, think of the computer display, and think of the keyboard um, for each of these different processes. And we'll talk about elaboration, elaborating, um, elaborating to be able to remember um, these three key processes, encoding, storage, and retrieval, okay? The role of attention is extremely important when you are trying to encode. When you're trying to remember something, you first have to encode it. And in order to encode something, you have to be paying attention to it. So attention is any focus or awareness of a narrow range of stimuli or events. And so I have to be really, really locked in uh, and paying attention to something. So you watching this video, you're paying attention to it. Maybe you're taking notes. It's going to allow you to encode a lot more information than if you were just uh, playing it in the background while you're washing dishes or, uh, you know, folding clothes, right? So your selective attention is really, really critical to everyday functioning. So you making a, a, a conscious effort to pay attention to certain things is going to be why you encode things versus not other things. It says research suggests that our human brain can effectively only handle one attention consuming task at a time. So we talked about that at the very beginning. Multitasking is not actually multitasking, it's task switching. And so we take our attention from one task to the next and we switch uh, pretty ineffectively, right? And so we have to be mindful of that. Cell phone conversations, texting and driving, all of those things are distracting us. And we're, we're paying attention to one thing, listening to, to one thing and trying to drive. Again, we will miss a turn or, you know, since we are driving and talking on the phone, a lot of the minute details and the details of, you know, what, what is the color of the car that I just passed? Or, you know, what's the, what's the light green or red that I just can't pass through? Just being on the phone, that can distract you. And so there is some variability uh, in individuals' ability to juggle tasks, but for the vast majority of us, it's difficult, right? And we might be able to juggle them, juggle them a lot more efficiently than others, but again, it's still very difficult for many of us to do, okay? Again, this is a situational awareness. Uh, it's based on really paying attention. Uh, they're gonna ask you to follow the book bag and see how many times it's passed, right? But while the book bag is being passed, a lot of other things are happening in the background. And if you are only focusing on the task at hand, it's gonna be really difficult to see some of the changes that happen in the background. And this is, again, a selective attention, right? You're paying attention to this green backpack, and while you're paying attention to it, things are passing by uh, in the background that you are unaware of. And so we have to be mindful of that uh, as we um, walk through life. Um, be situationally aware as you're entering into establishments or eating dinner out in public, you know, at a concert. Be extremely aware of your surroundings um, and don't just focus in on um, one particular thing. Be be everywhere at once if you can. Okay. So Fergus and Craig and Lockhart, these two scientists and psychologists discovered that there are several levels of processing for verbal information. And you got 
It's shallow processing, intermediate processing, and deep processing. And when you are reading a text, we go through each of these uh, pretty seamlessly and pretty automatically. The shallow level of processing is really just, we're looking at structural, the structure of the words on the page. So we're looking at, you know, the first letter of every, the first word of every sentence is going to be capitalized, right? The first letter of that word is going to be capitalized. We know where punctuation is. We know where, uh, you know, all of the different structures, the different words, uppercase, lowercase, uh, you know, all of those things are the structure, right? We're emphasizing the physical structure of the stimulus. Then the intermediate is looking at the words and seeing the, the sounds of the words. What do they sound like? What do they rhyme with, right? That is kind of a phonetic encoding, right? We do that oftentimes too, right? We look at the word cat and we can look at different sounds that uh, may rhyme with cat, brat, bat, right? Flat, <laughs> right? So then the third level of processing, which is the deepest level of processing, is the semantics, right? Uh, we're looking at the semantics. We're looking to emphasize the meaning of the words on the page, right? And that is where we can more easily retain information and then be able to regurgitate the meaning of things that happen, right? When we're talking about reading something and then retention of it and then being able to comprehend it and then regurgitate, that's what's really important. We're going to that deeper level of processing, right? Um, there's a study that was shown that they had three different groups of three different groups of people, and one group they focused specifically on the structural encoding. The second group focused on phonemic encoding. So when they got the list of words that they had, they focused on words that rhymed with a particular word that was presented to them. And then the third group. They looked at the words and then looked at the meaning of those words, and they were they were introduced with six, 60 words, right? So they had to remember 60 words based on these three levels of processing. Again, the first group did structural encoding, just looking at the structure of the words. The second group did phonemic, and then the third group did semantic. And the research results show that when the group did the deeper level of processing, the semantic, they were able to better recall words which had been processed more deeply, right? So they processed it semantically. And again, that supports that level of processing where you're able to do a deep level of processing that you're going to retain and recall more of the information that you get, that you read, right? So when you're reading a textbook, instead of just reading and skimming over it, make sure that you're looking at the words and the meaning of the words, especially those who are highlighted in bold, bolded, so that you can, again, get that encoded into your brain and then recall it when you need to, or retrieve it, recall it when you need to. Okay. Elaboration, when we talk about enriching the encoding process, there are several things that we do um, that make the encoding process a lot more effective. Uh, the one thing that we can do is what we call elaboration. And all that means is you're linking some stimulus to other information at the time of encoding. So um, the first couple of slides we looked at those three processes of memory, right? We looked at encoding, storage, and retrieval. And the analogy that they used was the keyboard was the encoding process, the uh, CPU or the hard drive was the storage process, and then the monitor was you able to go in and retrieve files. That was the retrieval process. So that'll be an easy way for you to remember, just using that analogy, that'll be an easy way to, for you to remember those three processes of memory. You have what we call visual imagery, which is creation of visual images to represent the words that you're trying to remember, right? So for us now, we know what a chair looks like. We can visualize a chair. We, we can visualize what a dog looks like, a cat looks like, uh, what a Hummer looks like, uh, what an airplane looks like. And those visual images allow us to encode things and then remember things a lot better. The dual encoding theory, um, Pavio's theory, uh, is that memory is enhanced by forming the, again, the meaning of words and those visual codes. And if you do those two things together, it leads to better recall. And so that's why when we are teaching our young people, you know, different objects, um, different vocabulary, it's good to place an image with it so that they can see the image and then tie the semantic and the word with it. And that's how they better recall um, the word, the vocabulary word. So that's really, really important. Uh, when you're teaching your young people, your, your younger siblings or your child, uh, you want to give them, show them the picture of what it is, give them the meaning of what it is, and then they can better recall later. 
The last thing is your motivation, right? You have to be extremely motivated to remember at the time of encoding. And that motivation improves your recall, right? So I need to get a good, a good nice rest before I begin studying. Because if I'm not motivated, if I don't have an energy to study, then it's going to be really difficult for me to remember the things that I read, the things that I'm trying to study. You have to be motivated to do it, right? The MCR is extremely important and improves recall later. So your motivation, um, even in your most difficult classes that you're not really interested in, make sure that you are motivated. Make sure you're motivated to study because that helps. Um, here are some examples down below. Many of you might not have been born around this time, but the World Trade Center was attacked on September 11th, 2001, right? Ways that people can remember that is by tying the meaning and different uh, mnemonics, uh, you know, number numbers to it, right? So 911 is an emergency situation. 911 was an emergency situation for our country in 2001. And so the attack on the World Trade Center certainly can constitute an emergency situation. So 911, September 11, 2001, those two things coincide. And so that might be easier to recall if you had to do something in history uh, with recalling a date and recalling a fact. Okay. So that is encoding, right? Encoding is extremely important, but you have to be paying attention and selective attention is extremely important when we're talking about the encoding process. Storage is, again, maintaining the memory of the information in your memory, right? There are several different theories, and, you know, you, you divide these memories uh, into separate storage, right? We've heard about what we call our sensory memory, our short-term memory, and our long-term memory. Our sensory memory, we'll talk about it, but, you know, these three boxes are really important. So our sensory memory is anything that is experienced by, by using our senses. So our sight, our hearing, our smell, touch, um, all of those things are senses, and that's our sensory input, right? So if I see something, if I see a red car, if I see a red Ferrari, if I see a big black dog, I can remember that because it's coming in through my visual system, right? If I'm looking at something and then I close my eyes real quick, that after image, right, that's the sensory input. You have to be paying attention to it for you to then be able to store it in your short term, and then the short term, if you're rehearsing it, right, then it gets pushed to your long term. And then when you need it, you can retrieve it, get it back to your short term, and then you can uh, spit it out, right? So Atkinson and Shrippen, this is their model, right? You got the sensory memory, short term memory, and then your long term memory. Again, sensory memory is briefly, again, something that briefly preserves information originally in sensory form, right? So there are different senses, different smells that we can remember, right? If you smell barbecue, you know what barbecue smells like. If you're smelling um, for individuals who are in the military or for someone who might be a firefighter, this is really, really dark, but people can smell what burning flesh smells like, right? Because they smelled it before. It's a distinct smell. When you uh, grew up in your grandmother's house, visiting your grandmother when you were younger, and maybe you walked into another home and you're like, man, this smells like my grandmother's house, right? It's a sensory memory. So there's a buffer, our five senses, right? Uh, sight, hearing, smell, taste, and touch. There are things that we can remember just based on the senses, right? We retain it accurately, but it's very, very brief. But those things that we uh, are tasting and seeing and smelling over and over and over again, those things are better embedded in our memory. And we can use those things uh, to then retrieve later on, right? An example of what we call that brief uh, sensory information is an after image, right? So if you're looking at a really, really bright light and then you close your eyes, you're going to still see that bright light, um, the, the, the image of the black bright light when you close your eyes because of that, that after image, right? It's the feeling of something that you see. When you smell a candle and it reminds you of a, a peaceful feeling, right? It's just to remind you of a certain cologne or a certain perfume. Man, that's, that's the perfume my, my grandmother used to wear, right? All of those things, again, trigger your memory based on those senses. Your short-term memory is the things that can last around for up to 20 seconds, right? So if you're trying to remember a telephone number, right? Somebody tells you a telephone number and you're trying to remember that telephone number, 
Again, it's a limited capacity. It can only can, can only maintain unrehearsed information for about 20 seconds. If you are in fact trying to rehearse something, right? Rehearsal is repetitively verbalizing and thinking about the information over and over and over again. It's a little easier to retrieve it once if you're rehearsing it. But if you're not rehearsing it, that's why you maybe somebody gives you a telephone number and you don't have your cell phone with you. And uh, it's in the next room. And so, you know, you're, you leave the room to go get your cell phone to type in the number. And then somebody talks to you. They interrupt your rehearsal process. Man, it's gone. Right. Because, again, 10 to 20 seconds is all you have without rehearsing something. Short term memory is lost. Right. So that's the durability of that. Lost information. Again, it's just caused by the time related decay. Memory traces just start to fade over time. And again, there's interference from other things that compete with the material that you're trying to trying to keep in your short term. Right. So there's a lot of different factors that lead to the decay. But we'll talk about why we forget things. And the reason why we forget things is because we have limited capacity in our mental brain and memory. Right. So we can't keep everything working in the short term. That's too cognitively and, and too draining. Right. So we want to, again, forget some things so that we make room for other information that we might need. Okay. Again, short-term memory, the capacity, we talked about the duration of from 10 to 20, up to 20 seconds without rehearsal, but our capacity to remember things is around five things, right? We can, originally it was thought, um, uh, Dr. Miller thought in 1956 that we could originally hold things in our memory from, you know, seven plus or minus two things, right? But, that overestimated the uh, the rehearsal that we were doing, right? If you're not rehearsing something, then it's a lot a lot harder to be able to have a larger capacity. If you can rehearse, it is a lot easier to hold a lot more things in your brain, right? One thing that we do have, and one of the techniques that we have is chunking. Chunking allows us to take something uh, that's a large, large amount of items and then chunk them into smaller pieces. Right, so we group familiar stimuli stored in a single unit, and that can increase our short-term memory. And that's why they break the telephone number into those three different sections. You have your area code, you have the three digits, and you have the dash, and you have the four digits. Right, so breaking those memory, breaking those items up into three individual, like three groups of units, that makes the short-term memory a lot better. Right, so we can we can we have what six, seven, oh yeah, six, three. Six, yeah, ten. We can score. We can, we can store ten items based on the chunking process, right? Here's an example. If I just gave you uh, FBI, NBC, CIA, IBM, I just gave you those and asked you without chunking, asked you to recall uh, some of those, um, some of these letters. You wouldn't be able to recall much of them at all. I mean, you might be able to recall the first. It's called primacy, primacy, recency effect. So you might be able to recall the first three, the last three, but everything in the middle would be gone, right? But if I told you to chunk it, maybe with two, F, B, I, N, B, C, C, I, A, I, B, O, right? You may be able to do a better job with chunking it, having pairs of two, right? Two, you know, two, right? But what if I told you to chunk it in with three? So now I got, again, I'm from one, two, three, let's see, three, four, three, six, nine, twelve. So I'm from 12 items, right? Here's 12 individual items. Trying to store that, not going to be possible, right? Now I have six items. I, I broke them up into twos. And then if you break it up into threes, it's really, really easy to remember this. And you can draw some associations with some of this as well, right? You got FBI, NBC, CIA, IBM, right? So I got FBI, you know, uh, law enforcement, NBC is a television network, CIA, another law enforcement, IBM, computer company, right? So you can use those and make those associations, and then you'll probably do better to, again, increase your capacity. But chunking is one of those techniques, okay? Short-term memory as working memory. So our working memory is, again, that ability for us to hold and manipulate information in our conscious attention. And many times, Again, that rehearsal process is allowing us to use our short-term and working memory slash working memory to make sure that we're getting the things into the short-term and then into the long-term uh, memory, right? So it's a modular system, right, for temporarily storing and manipulating information in 
uh, our short term. So it's working. It's allowing us to work with things, right? So when we talk about the central executive system, we're switching our focus of attention and dividing that attention as needed between two or three different things, right? And so we're doing that and we're listening to something and we're reading something, but we're selectively paying attention and dividing that attention between uh, several things. The phonological loop, again, is just the rest recitation to temporarily hold on to a phone number. So our working memory, we're just reciting the phone number over and over and over again. Uh, my mother's tel telephone number, uh, home number back in the day was uh, 256-851-6258. 256-851-6258. And I can remember that because, again, it's ingrained in my head. I shrunk it now. 256-851-6258. Like, I can hear it. I can see it. It's been ingrained in my brain, right? But if I told you to remember that number, then you would have to put it on a phonological loop because it's a new number to you, right? The visual sketch pad. Visual special sketch pad. That's when you see something, you can temporarily hold and manipulate images in your visual cognitive map, right? So I can ask you what your uh, room looks like in your dorm room, your, your room at home looks like. You can see it vividly and you can mentally rearrange furniture in your bedroom or your house, right? Just based on the memories that you have, you're able to hold it, right? The episodic buffer is this, it's a uh, process that we use to interface between our working memory and the long-term memory. So it's that, that piece, right? In the middle, right, it's that transition from the interface between that working short-term memory and the long-term memory, right? But again, our capacity to do that is just the ability to manipulate things in our in our short-term memory. Okay, a long-term memory, right? This is when we get it. You got your sensory input, short-term, then long-term. Long-term memory, you're able to remember things a lot better, right? When it has something tied to it. Right. We're able to remember our favorite song or, you know, uh, our birth, one of our favorite birthday parties because of the memories and the emotions that are tied to it. We have almost an unlimited capacity to store and hold on information over very lengthy periods of time, perhaps even a lifetime. Right. Some of the things uh, we learned when we were young children will probably know for the rest of our life. I probably know my mom's telephone number, home number for the rest of my life because I used it so often when I was younger. And I'll, I'll probably know it for a lifetime, right? So when we talk about long-term memory, flashbulb memories are uh, a phenomenon that we use, and they are really, really unusually vivid and detailed recollections of momentous events, right? If you are or had a, uh, a really traumatic event happen, maybe a, a very severe car crash, or you were in, um, you know, maybe you, you you saw someone that you maybe maybe your dog passed away when you were younger. Right. Maybe he was hit by a car. Um, those are ingrained in your memory. Right. Those are things that you'll never forget. You'll always remember those things. And those are those flashbulb memories. Flashbulb memories are uh, neither as accurate nor as special as once believed. But they they do. Then they, they are a key uh, when you do see something. Right. If you were around when and I botched this. But, you know, this is Hurricane Katrina. Uh, this is the terrorist attacks uh, of September 11th, you know, September 11th, 2001. I need to re, re, uh, fix that that title there. But again, the flashbulb memories do help us, but they do become less detailed and complete with time and are often inaccurate over, over the course of time. Right. So I can remember when I was uh, where I was. Um, I know I was in middle school. Uh, when I think about the teacher, when I think about you know, what classroom I was in. I don't remember all the, the minute details, but I can tell you that I, I think I was in the seventh grade uh, and I think I was in uh, Mr. Carpenter's class. But who knows? I'll have to go back and, and confirm that. So again, the factual representation in our memory, right? There are several things that we do um, to help store certain things in our memory bank. Okay. Uh, when we talk about conceptual hierarchies, right, we talk about clustering, and this is a, the clustering means I'm, I'm grouping things, similar things into groups. And then we talk about conceptual hierarchy. This is that multi-level classification system where I have different groups and I have a uh, dog, or let's say canine, canines at the top, and then I have uh, 
domesticated dog, I have wild dogs. Then I got you know, domesticated dogs, I have pit bulls, I have shih tzus, I have German shepherds. Domesticated dogs, I have uh, or canines, I have you know, wild dogs, I have uh, hyenas, wolves, foxes, all of these are canines, right? So again, those are hierarchies. Then I have what we call schemas. Schemas are things that we remember based on an experience that we've had. You have a schema for what it what it is to, to go to a restaurant, right? The schema is they ask you, you go to the, the reception, not the reception, but the, the, yeah, you can call it the receptionist, the dentist office. You go to the receptionist, they ask you if you have an appointment. You say, I have an appointment at this time. They say, okay, fill out this uh, insurance information or if you're a new patient, fill out this new, new, new patient information. Uh, you can take a seat and you'll be called when you're ready, right? So all of those things are schemas. You have a schema about what it feels, what it means to go on a date, right? You go pick up the date, you can get buy the food, you go home, boom, boom, boom. We know all the different schemas. People are, are more likely to remember things that are consistent with their schemas. If the schema is off, thrown off in some way, it, you're, it's a little harder to remember those things, right? But again, we organize them in clusters based on our previous experience that we've had. Okay? So it says, look at this list of words. How would you cluster or group them? What would the cluster names be? All right, so you got grapes, table, bus, apple, chair, airplane, desk, banana, so on and so forth, right? If you were to cluster these into groups, what, how many groups maybe would you have? And then what would those names be? You can pause it, but here is what I might cluster them as, right? So I got fruit, furniture, and modes of transportation. So grapes, plums, peaches, all, all fruit, tables, chairs, sofas, lamps, those, that's all furniture, and then the modes of transportation, bus, airplane, car, train, motorcycle, all of those are what we call uh, modes of transportation. But clustering, again, we do that more often than we think. It's a natural process that we do. Okay. Here's the conceptual hierarchy. Okay, Like I talked about before, you have animals, animals at the top. You have animals that are broken up. Animals, I mean mammals, excuse me, birds. You have in mammals, you have canines, felines, rodents, birds, you have fowl, waterfowl. Right? You can break it down even further for canine, coyote, dog, fox, wolf, bobcat, cougar, lion, tiger, and go even and drill it down even further. Right? So again, here are this is level one, literally broad. Level two is a little more detailed. Level three and then level four, they're really, really detailed and uh, Again, you're able to break it down even further than that. Okay. Again, here are schemas. Just I, you know, identify social schemas. You got social schemas. You're on a date. You be respectful. You don't eat garlic. You pay for the movie tickets. Uh, at an event, right? Maybe you're at a networking event. You have professionalism. You have a portfolio. Business suit. You handshake. Make eye contact. Uh, personal or person schemas. Right, your appearance, your behavior, your personality, your preferences, those that's your schema for yourself. Um, and then you have your, I mean, your self schema. I'm a future doctor, smart, funny, I hate broccoli, right? And your person schema uh, for someone who's of a, another nationality or race, uh, maybe someone who is an athlete, maybe a basketball player. You have a schema that for someone who's a basketball player, maybe they're tall, you know, uh, they wear sweatpants all the time, they wear. Uh, slides, they have tattoos, whatever your schema is for a basketball player. Again, you have different schemas based on uh, different types. Okay. Uh, another thing that happens when we talk about knowledge um, represented in our memory is we do what we call a semantic network. And we talk about semantics, right? Semantics means uh, meaning of something, right? So we have different nodes, and the semantic network is useful when we try to explain. Uh, one word and how that word is related to other words. And I'll show you an example of that. And then you have what we call spreading activation, right? And this is the process when people think about a word and their thoughts naturally go to related words. So if I said peanut butter, you're going to say jelly and bread, right? If I said uh, watermelon, you might say picnic. You may say barbecue, right? Again, those are spreading activation, right? You're able to get the word, and then there is a semantic. It spreads out, and you're able to include other things. If I said red, you might say apple. You might say fire truck. 
right? You might say lipstick, right? Those are, again, spreading the activation. They are associated and they spread up to other related words, okay? So here is the semantic network, right? Again, you see animal. Animals, they eat, they breathe, they move. Animals have fish, they have gills, they swim, they have fins, birds, they can fly. You got some birds that can't fly, right? So you're able to, again, meaning, you're able to divide descriptions of different things based on just a small word, and then it spreads out, right, to a network of other meaning for that uh, particular term or concept. You have what we call spreading activation. Again, if I say street, you got ambulance, you got car, you got bus, you got vehicle. I say red, you say all the other colors. You might say fire, apples, cherries, roses. Uh, when I say roses, flowers, violets, again, all of those are spreading, spreading the activation out, okay? So it's, again, one word, and then you spread the activation of the association with other words, okay? So it says, which uh, or what is the grouping of a list of words or concepts into categories or hierarchies based on common properties between them? If you think about it, just go through. It says clustering. I mean, not clustering. It says, I think I just gave you the answer. But again, grouping of a list of words or concepts into categories or hierarchies based on common properties between them. Again, clustering is clustering is that where you're, again, tendency to put similar things and items in groups. And that conceptual hierarchy is a multi-level classification system based on common properties that you have. Okay. All right. So again, the last piece of the uh, memory process is retrieval. Again, getting information out of that memory, getting information out of long-term memory. Once you have it in there, you know what a, a fire truck looks like, what it sounds like, um, who's associated with fire trucks. You know that based on, again, it being in your long-term memory, right? You have that in, in, ingrained in your, in your brain. You know your mother's grandma, your, your grandmother's birthday, you know your mom's birthday, you know your dad's birthday based on it being ingrained in your long term. And all you have to do is retrieve it, right? If I ask you what um, uh, tired meant, you know the definition of tired because, again, you, you have it ingrained in your brain. Okay? All right. So using cues to aid in retrieval, like what does that mean? What does that mean specifically for us, right? Tip of the tongue phenomena is a phenomenon where we have a temporary, temporary inability to remember something, right? But it's there. We just have to kind of incubate and make sure that we're in the process to, again, make it and retrieve it, right? It happens to us about once a week and it increases with age, right? We have it there, but we just can't get it, right? Tip of the tongue phenomenon, if you wouldn't have asked me, I could have told you, right? And then maybe a couple of hours later, you find it, right? Or you just have to go find it, right? But there are retrieval cues. Um, again, there are stimuli that help gain access to memory, such as hints, uh, related information, partial recollections. If you've ever watched uh, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, you know they have those uh, uh, those those they can save you with uh, a lifeline, right? Let me use a lifeline. You can call a friend, or they give me a hint, and you're able to retrieve based on those retrieval cues, right? It's just a lifeline, and we use some of these lifelines whenever we're wanting to retrieve something that we can. Okay. Context clues are extremely important. Um, when we were taking the ACT, it was important that we uh, use context clues. If we didn't know a vocabulary word, we read the, read the sentences and read the sentence around the word and be able to then retrieve, right? They had some clues and we're able to facilitate and retrieve the information based on those context clues. Right. Value of again, reinstating the context of an event may account for how people and use hyp hypno hyp hypnosis. We talked about hypnosis in um, various variations of consciousness. But when you put people in the same context they were in, then they may be it might be a little easier for them to recall information if they're in the same context. And that's why being in a, in a context when you're looking to help somebody remember something is really, really important. Right. Um, if you've ever gone from a room and forgot what you were going to the next room for, maybe you're going to get a pen and man, I forgot what I was coming here for. 
And then you go back to your, your room and you're like, oh, my yes, I'm supposed to get the pen, right? So, again, going back to the context oftentimes helps you uh, to remember the event, just reinstating the context uh, of an event that you were, you were trying to remember something. Like okay. Reconstructing memories, right? Our memories are not as accurate, are not as bulletproof as we, as we think they are, right? If I ask you about an event that happened when you were five or six years old, you may have some of the, the facts, but you're not going to have all of them as accurately as you think you do, right? And things that happen after that event can distort the details of things that happened in the past, right? And I can, I can give information. I can present you with information. Maybe it's information. Um, I can, I can in, input a memory into your, into your system if it matches some, something similar to what you've experienced, right? So what if I asked you, I said, you remember when you were lost in the mall when you were three years old, right? Right? And I continue to repeat that and ask you about it. What happened? Right? And maybe you were never lost in the mall when you were three years old, right? But if that is something similar to what you maybe experienced, it's some, something similar to what has may have happened to you, then it might be easier for you to go ahead and I can input that, that memory in there, and then you go ahead and, and elaborate on details that, that may never have happened, right? But the mis misinformation effect occurs when participants recall an event they witnessed is altered by introducing, introducing misleading post-event information, right? This happens a lot with eyewitness testimonies, right? Um, people are in the heat of the moment. The event is really, really uh, traumatic, really, really high emotionally, and the investigators and the interrogators get into this in the, in the, in the interrogation room and they start inputting information that is not true. And it misleads the witness to tell people, tell stuff, maybe even admit to doing something that they did not do. Right. And that happens all the time because our memories can be distorted by, again, knowledge of just basic facts. Right. If we trust somebody that is giving us information, then it's easier for us to be distorted and for our information to be distorted and, and our memories to be distorted, right? Uh, retelling a story can also introduce inaccuracies into memory, right? We can be retelling the story over and over and again, right? And so think about your uncle that has all these stories that he's telling you from way back when. There, There is some truth to it, but I guarantee you there is some inaccuracy to it too. And so you need to be really skeptical when your uncle says he, he was an all-American running back when, you know, he may not have been, right? Um, so just be, be mindful of that when you retell stories, inaccuracies uh, are in, put into the memory, right? So when we talk about memory, it's not bulletproof. It's, it's not as accurate as we think. Um, can be really malleable and really fragile. Um, so we have to take that into account when we are listening to someone tell us a story about something that they've done in the past. Okay. Again, here is another uh, opportunity for you to see um, the misinformation effect in, uh, in, 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 this, in an example, right? And so what happens, you're going to see how the investigator is again, giving false information um, and is input false memory based on different words that he says uh, and just by saying certain terms or terminology, it throws off um, the witnesses and what they, what they think they saw. Okay? But again, I will post those links uh, into uh, the description in the bottom. Okay. So when we're trying to remember something, right, when we're trying to remember something, uh, source monitoring plays a big role and interferes in the origins of our memory, right? When we are trying to find out the source of where we, where we learn something, it can throw off how we, how we understand what's, what's being done, right? So people decide at the time of retrieval where memories come from, right? If you heard a story about you know, a young child that was kidnapped and, and then returned home from their family. Like, who told me that? Did I learn that? I hear that on the news or did I hear that from a coworker? Did I hear that from my mom telling me on the phone the other night? Right. So we have a lot of source monitoring errors. Right. We get a lot of information over the course of the day and a lot of stuff that we hear, a lot of stuff that we see. Uh, again, we miss uh, mislabel the source sometimes. Right. And this occurs when our memory uh, is derived from one source, is misattributed to another source, right? So we think we heard the story from our mom, but we actually heard it from our professor. They told us to talk to us about it, about it in class, right? So we have to be really mindful of that. And source monitoring does explain why uh, memories of events that 
we never actually saw our experience, right? Because um, our, our sources, the sources of our, our the, the monitor, uh, the sources of our memories are thrown off, right? So we didn't actually hear that from, um, you know, our mom. We heard it from uh, our friend, right? And so it throws off um, our memories and, and, and how we recall events. Okay. So why do we forget, right? Why do we forget? I don't know why we'll go back. What what the, the, the memory and lapses? Why why do we forget? Is it is it important? Is it a natural part of why um, why we're why we're alive? I think it is. Right. We we can't remember everything uh, because our brains have a limited capacity. We learned about uh, the capacity. We talked about um, the different things that we talk about and how we recall things. But again, we can't remember everything. We have so much going on, and we have to. Let some stuff go, and we have to be mindful of of what's happening and what what can happen with our memories. Okay, so we talk about stress in memory, right? A little stress can be a great motivator, right? But if you have too much stress, stress can inhibit the way we form memories and be able to retrieve memories. So it's important that we monitor our stress level, especially again when we talk about school. You have to be getting the right amount of sleep. You have to be managing your stress really well, the stress can affect how your memories are formed. And if we're really, really stressed out, um, being able to put things into our working memory or, or, or you know, our short-term memory, it's more difficult to learn things when we're really stressed out. So it's important that, that you get to a point where you can relax because stress can affect different things and even affect how, how we remember things and what we remember, right? If I'm uh, in a really, really high stress, high emotionally charged environment and something happens to me, the, the memory can be distorted just based on the level of stress that I have in that moment, right? Something that might have been really mild, um, I can remember it as being really, really high charge because of the stress level that I have. It might have been something that's really, really minuscule, really, really minor, but I'm so stressed that I think it's really, really, uh, really, really bad, really, really uh influential and it's not all that influential at all. all right so we have to be mindful about what our how our stress responds and how we manage our stress in moments right it says memory can also change after they're formed when we are really really stressed out right so again that's why when we talk about eyewitness testimonies if it's a really traumatic event you can't always be um as sure that the the memory or the uh, the eyewitness testimony is accurate because if it's a high stress, high emotionally charged environment that they saw the, the event in, it could be changed just based on um, the stress level they were experiencing during that time. Okay. Um, here's a game, um, brain games. I love brain games. It's a psychology um, uh, piece and it, it talks about the brain under stress, right? How when you're stressed out, you forget things. Um, I, I do a lot of some public speaking every now and then. And, and sometimes when I'm extremely stressed out, when I'm extremely, um, you know, really kind of in my feelings, right? I forget certain things, right? I, I'll write out an entire speech. I have my note cards, I have my bullet points and I'll be using it. And I'm trying to rush, 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 rush through because my brain is, you know, so overwhelmed that I forget some of the most important parts of, uh, of the speech, right? So it's important. Calm down, breathe, slow down, so that your stress response doesn't affect um, your memory. Okay. So how quickly do we forget, right? There are things that we, we may forget faster than others, right? And so uh, there was a study that was done by Ebbinghaus, and this is the forgetting curve. You see that uh, there's a really, really stark and, and really, really drastic decline in memory. Uh, within the first 60 minutes, right? Retention of something is really, I mean, the first 60 minutes, right? And then you have around 30 days of retention gets a little, it kind of flattens out. But retention after about 30 days, 30 days or so, about 30% of what you remember, uh, excuse me, 25% of what you, what you thought you remember is no longer there, right? But there's a drastic, sharp drop in retention during the first few hours if you're not rehearsing it. And so this was that, um, the study that was done, he had like nine cents, consonant, vowel, consonant arrangements um, that do not correspond to any word. So it's like uh, 
C-O-C, right? And so he would remember a word like that, and he'd have a list of words that he remembered. And over the course of time, in that first hour or so, really, really stark, drast, drastic, sharp uh, drop in the retention, right? Um, and so he was unable, un he was unable to recall, or able to recall only about forty uh, percent of those nine cent syllables, right? And then about thirty days later, only twenty five percent, right? So again, over the course of time, that's how we forget, right? Um, we have a decay over the course of time. The retention and forgetting over time happens naturally with everything that we think, everything that we see, we read. I mean, again, we're going to forget it until unless we keep engaging with the materials. That's why it's important that you don't just cram, right? You want to be able to uh, engage with the material, make sure you're reading the material, continue to engage, and make sure that everything is really, really uh, possible for you to get it. Right. You have to be able to engage with the material so that your forgetting is not instant. Right. You want to re-engage, re-merge so that your memory uh, does a lot better and you don't forget as, as quickly. OK, so again, here, these were his, his experience with that experiment. So memory weakens over time. These are the results. Right. The biggest drop of retention happens soon after learning. it. Um, it's easier to remember things that have meaning. So put meaning to something. Right. Yeah, we talk about elaboration. When you want to remember something, elaborate, put meaning to it, put an image to it. Um, maybe tie it to something that happened in your life. It has to have some applicability so that it makes and has some meaning. Uh, the way something is presented affects your learning, right? So if you are, we talked about those learning styles. If you are a visual learner and this, being able to see it is, is more uh, helpful for you, then again, you want to present it that way and then remember it that way, right? How you feel affects how, how well your memory thinks, right? If you're really, really stressed out, if you're really, really sad, it's going to affect your memory. Um, so really be uh, cognizant of how you feel before you study. Make sure you don't go into a study session really, really stressed out. Take some time to, to kind of come down, breathe, make some, do some mindfulness techniques, do some meditation. Make sure you are in the right state of mind. Um, here are different measures of forgetting. So when you're looking to see how much of measure uh, forgetting and, 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 and quantify it, you either do what we call retention, um, which is the proportion of material retained. And so when we talk about Ebbinghaus, how much of those nonsense syllables did he retain? Um, out of the 100 words that he presented himself with, he only retained 40% of them, right? So again, he only retained 40, right? So we have to be mindful of that. That's retention, right? Proportion of material retained or remembered. Uh, the retention interval is the time between the presentation of the materials and the measurement of forgetting, right? So in Ebbing's house case, he had, you know, 60 minutes to 31 days, right? So at 31 days, he was only able to retain only 25% of the words or those nine cent syllables that he was able to retain, right? The, there are three methods uh, to measure forgetting and retention. We have what we call a recall measure, you have recognition measure, and then you have what we call a relearning measure. The recall measure is reproducing information on your own without any cues, right? So if I asked you um, an essay question, I asked you a question, and I asked you, I was like, hey, you know, who was, uh, who was considered the father of psychology? And uh, when was the first uh, psych psychological laboratory uh, created? When did it emerge, right? You could recall and say, um, Leipzig, Germany, 1879. Maybe that's that's the that's the terminology, right? That's the date. I'm able to recall that without any cues because I know it, right? Recognition is select previously learned information from an array of options, right? So this is multiple choice. You have the right answers in there somewhere, and you're able to recall it based on recognize, based on the question you got, and then the thing that you know that is assigned to whatever that question is. And then the relearning measure is uh, me memorizing information the second time to determine how much time and effort is saved to relearn it before, right? So you remember the song, but for a while you didn't, you didn't rehearse it, you didn't sing it, and so you kind of forgot it. But then you were tried to relearn the song again, and it took you a shorter time to remember the second time around because of that relearning measure. Right. So it only took you 
a fraction of the time to remember the second time. Okay. So again, here is a, again a, you know another example of why we forget. It's going to explain why we forget things. Part of it is because again we have a limited capacity, and you can't remember everything, right? And so there's a natural uh, decay, um, and memory is going to decay just based on making room for other memories and competing material that we must uh, must remember that helps us to survive. So there are things that aren't important to us that we don't need to remember. There are things that are really really vital for our survival. That we must remember and so it's important that we uh, delete some things that some things decay and other things remain um, because they help us to survive and, and get and reach the goals that we need to reach okay again we forget because what we call what we call pseudo forgetting uh, it's a phenomenon where uh, you think you forgot something that you never really learned in the first place right again sometimes that happens when when we don't well we have that source monitoring uh, uh, error Right. We thought we, we thought we learned something that we actually did. not Right. So the information was never inserted into memory. Um, we thought we were, were learning it. Maybe I was watching TV as I was reading a textbook and, you know, I thought I studied it, but I actually didn't. Right. And it's really just a tribute to the lack of lack of attention. You didn't pay attention to it. You were listening to the music. Maybe uh, one of your favorite songs came on and you were reading a text. and It really wasn't really wasn't being being, being encoded like you thought it was. Right, so it's important that you focus your attention on it, so that you're actually paying attention and focusing that attention on what you need. Right, decay theory is again the idea that things just have to decay. Memory traces fade with time. Um, the effects in sensory and short-term memory occur over time. Right, we can't really, and researchers have not been able to kind of clearly demonstrate that decay causes long-term memory forgetting, but we're unable to really see what happens because again there's a decay right and then the short-term memory long-term short-term effects but again it allows us to kind of see things that that aren't necessarily there right we decay because again we can't store everything there the memory traces fade with time and that just happens right you can't remove everything and when you have competing material coming in as quickly as things are leaving um, that's kind of what happens kind of replacing things with things that may not be as as, as of importance Okay. Um, why we forget are some other reasons why, right? Interference theory. This is the idea that people forget information uh, because competing information um, is coming in, right? Um, I'm studying for my math test and then I, you know, I try to study for my calculus test or my calculus test and then I'm trying to study for my chemistry test. I have competing information in and then I forget some things that I studied for my calculus test because I'm, I studied right after studying for calculus. I studied for chemistry, so I forgot some things that I studied for, for calculus, right? You got retroactive inter interference, right? You got proactive interference. So retroactive is new information impairs the retention of previously learned information, right? So if I'm studying for calculus, I study chemistry, right? My chemistry is, again, hindering my recall of things that I studied for calculus. So the new information is impairing my retention of the previously learned information. So we have to figure out ways to get around that. Proactive interference occurs when previously learned information interferes with the retention of new information, right? So I'm studying for calculus right now, and it's making it extremely hard for me to remember anything for chemistry that I'm trying to study for now, because all the old information is hindering me from learning and remembering the things or learning any new information that I have. Okay. And so here are some here are some visual representations here. So when we talk about uh, retroactive interference, um, the, you know, you study for economics and then you study for psychology next. It, the new learning information is interfering with the old, right? So by studying, by studying, studying psychology here, me taking my economics test is making me hard to recall information that I study here. So I might need to study economics first or right, study economics second. And then, then I have my, again, economic steps, right? Proactive interference is where all learning interferes with new learning, right? So I have studied for my psychology test, studied for my economics test, but since I studied for psychology, it's interfering with me studying for, for economics. So now, man, I'm, I'm done. So I maybe I should study for economics first, and then maybe not even study for psychology because I need to, again, get this, this economics test. Right on the money. 
Okay. Um, again, retrieval failure. Um, we're talking about uh, the breakdown and the process of uh, retrieval. We have encoding specificity principle. So well, this is the value of the retrieval queue depends on how well it corresponds to the memory code, right? So if the meaning of a word was emphasized during encoding, semantic cues should be best, right? So if I, if I just look at the structure of a word, then when I'm looking at the structural cues, that should be the best way that I retrieve it, right? But if my the way that I encoded the information is different than the way that I'm trying to retrieve it, I may not be able to match it one-to-one, -one, and that might be the failure, right? Um, motivated forgetting is another reason why we forget. We forget things because there are things in our uh, world that happen that we want to forget. And repression is keeping really distressing thoughts and feelings buried in the unconscious because we do not want to remember those things. And we repress those things. We push some things down because we don't want to remember them. And it's not that we've forgotten them because if something triggered the memory, it could come back. But we... Uh, we intentionally forget things and try to repress things uh, because we want to avoid um, the tendency of having those bad memories come back up and the emotion and, and the feelings that we get with those bad memories. Okay. Um, again, here is a, a real world example of things that happen, right? Uh, people experience abuse more often than we think they do. And a lot of times, especially for young children, they repress those memories because they don't um, want to bring those memories up. And, and sometimes it's because they don't feel like they're going to be um, believed, right? And so if they're not believed, then, you know, it's really important that, you know, for themselves to protect themselves, protect their well-being, they want to repress those things, push them things, push those things down and, you know, keep them thing, keep them under wraps, right? There is skepticism that you know when people recover those memories that they're not true but you know the the statistics show that even in ontario canada about 13 um, percent of females have experienced um, some type of abuse uh, it's more common than we realize almost four four point five percent of males reported that they have been victims of sexual abuse during their childhood um, and you know sometimes they bury those things down um, into their unconscious right um, there are some skeptics, skeptics that say, or skeptics, excuse me, that say that people recover things out of their memories because they're being persuaded and being suggested, right, um, by therapists. But, uh, and then there are, you know, there's some mis misinformation effect that might be the blame. And source monitoring errors may also be the blame of why uh, some memories are being created. But again, oftentimes these things are just being repressed. And there are things that, um, happen when they're talking to a therapist that, again, recover, uncover some of those memories, and then they're able to, to come forth, right? Oftentimes, um, therapists may not, not, may not even be mentioning any, anything about abuse or sexual abuse, but uh, something they say or some question they ask might just trigger um, the recall of some of those memories that may have been repressed uh, when they were child, children. Okay. So again, we're talking about the physiology of memory. So we're talking about the, the structures of the brain and how those structures of the brain uh, influence our memory. Okay. Um, so the anatomy of a memory, right? Um, when we talk about amnesia, when we talk about the brain, um, the cases of amnesia resulting from a head injury are a useful source of clues about the anatomical basis of memory. So what happens when someone has amnesia now we're able to look at the different structures of the brain to see what structures of the brain have been impacted or are being impacted by um, that particular memory loss. Um, retrograde amnesia is an amnesia where the person loses memory for events that occurred prior to the memory. So they can't remember anything um, before uh, the memory, right? Or before the incident or whatever the injury was, the head, head trauma. Um, anterograde amnesia is when a person loses memories uh, for events that occur after the injury, so they can't form any new memory, right? And so they look at individuals to see, you know, what portions of the brain are, uh, you know, changed, right? They look at the MRI, they look at the fMRI to see what parts of the brain are, are more active and most active. Uh, but again, looking at a normal functioning brain and then a MRI of another brain, they're looking at the different structures to see if there are issues um, in different structures that might be changed. Um, 
uh, here is an, a, uh, an idea um, in, a, in a, a case study that was done. A guy named H.M., he had surgery uh, to relieve debilitating epileptic seizures, right? Uh, that occurred about 10 times per day. And when they cut um, his corpus callosum, right? The surgery wiped out most of his ability to form long-term memories, right? So any anything as kind of like an ant anterograde amnesia, any memory loss in the in the in events that happened currently, he was unable to form those new memories. And and so they were able to see that that surgery, though it did wipe out those epileptic seizures, it did again play a big role in uh, that structure in his brain played a big role in the, him forming any long term new memories. And so. Now we're understanding that parts of our brains are associated with different parts of the memory. Okay. Uh, here's a movie, uh, you know, psychology in, in movies happens all the time, right? Uh, 50 First Dates um, is a really, really hilarious movie. So this guy right here, um, he has anterior grade amnesia. And again, I'll, I'll put this in this link in the description. But again, 50, this guy, he, after about 10 seconds, you can introduce yourself to him. And then about 10 seconds later, he just, he forgets and he asks you your name again. And so he can't store any new memories in his brain. Uh, he knows that something happened to him in the past, but he can't really, um, he can't really even understand what happened to him in the past either. So he has this anterior grand amnesia where he's unable to form new memories. And it's pretty hilarious. But again, it does happen where you can't form new memories. And, and uh, can be some, sometimes it can be really frustrating uh, when you're trying to remember something and and you can't hold it into your long-term memory, okay? So here is kind of the neural circuitry of our brain. And one of the biggest pieces of our brain and structures of our brain that's uh, uh, one of the biggest uh, influences of how we store memories is our hippocampus. And when we talk about consolidation, consolidation is the part that happens in our hippocampus. And it happens specifically when we are getting our rest. When we're getting our rest, it provides our, our brain the opportunity to consolidate, um, to produce, again, that neurogenesis, which is kind of sculpting those neural circuits to underlie uh, our memory, right? If we're not getting enough rest, our brain doesn't go through those REM cycles, uh, that deep sleep and the REM cycles that we talked about and uh, the variations in consciousness. That's when uh, the hippocampus, uh, the cerebral cortex is, is being able to recover and heal itself and then create those memory pathways so that we can better understand and, and store uh, some of the memories that we've learned, right? So it's important that when you study something the night before, hey, get a good night's nice rest so that your brain can consolidate and do some neurogenesis so that you are creating those neural circuitry and those, that, that synaptic transmission between those, those, neuro, those neural sites so that you can remember in, in a more effective and efficient fashion, okay? But again, the hippocampus is the part of the brain that is most specific um, for uh, memory. Okay. We'll finish off on memory systems and then we'll we'll get out of here. Okay. Um, you have what we call declarative versus non-declarative memory. And declarative memory, uh, declarative memory is just those hard factual information, right? Uh, we, you know, you have uh, contains the recollections of words, definitions, names, dates, faces, events, concepts, and ideas. So when you're going through uh, and trying to study for your psychology exam, you're using your de declarative memory when you're trying to recall those facts uh, for the exam, right? The non-declarative memory uh, are those procedural memories, and these are memories for any actions, uh, skills. These are conditioned responses and emotional memories, like riding a bike, right? Typing, tying one's shoes. Those are procedural things that we we know. We, uh, you know, maybe if we don't ride a bike for a while, um, when they say it's like riding a bike, that's your non-declarative memory coming and, and firing, right? Your not your declarative memory requires conscious and effortful processing, right? But your non-declarative memory is largely automatic. Once you remember it, once you learn it, and you get it into your memory bank, it's it requires little effort, little little attention because it's second nature to you. Now you're, you're it requires less of your brain, uh, your brain power, uh, and you're able to use other other parts of your brain to to remember things. Okay, uh, semantic versus episodic, right? So Endel Tovin, um further subdivided declarative memory into uh, what we call semantic 
and episodic memory, right? So declarative, um, again, semantic and episodic. Episodic memory is these chronological things. It's a record of things that you've done, you've seen, and you've heard. These are your personal experiences, right? And so you're episodic. You remember your first date. You remember your, your prom. You remember graduation. Those are things that are episodic. Those are things that you can remember. And oftentimes, there are visual images that you can see. Then you have what we call semantic memory. These are things, general knowledge that you remember. And it's declarative because maybe things that you've learned about psychology, now you've stored, um, you know that REM sleep, you know that a sleep cycle, like for me, I know that a sleep cycle, uh, those four stages of sleep, about 90 minutes, that's a full sleep cycle. I know what REM sleep is, right? Um, you know uh, that psychology is a study of the mind and behavior, right? That is just general knowledge that is not tied uh, to the time when it was learned. You can just recall it. It's declarative. Okay? You can declare it. Non-declarative things that you can do, um, things that you remember doing, riding a bicycle, um, tying your shoes. Uh, crocheting, braiding hair, all those things are uh, non-declarative memories. Okay. And then the last thing we talk about, one of the last things is what we call perspective versus retrospective memory. Okay. Retrospective memory involves uh, remembering events from the past or previously learned information. Right. So again, you remember um, episodic memory, that's also uh, re retrospective. I can remember my senior prom. Uh, I remember who won American Idol in 2003. Um, I think that was Ruben Stutter. Um, Ruben Stutter was, uh, he's a graduate of Alabama A&M. Um, sings extremely well. You all may know Ruben Stutter. And then you have what we call prospective memory. And this involves uh, remembering to perform actions in, in the future, right? I know I need to uh, study for an exam um, this evening, right? So I need to remember to do that. Uh, my mom told me to text her after class. so. I need to text her back. Bring your umbrella to class because you remember that it's supposed to rain the night before, I mean, the, the day uh, tomorrow. So I need to remember to get my umbrella, right? Smartphones um, are inciting those, those reminders are hurting us uh, and devices are causing a decline in prospective memory. So they're hurting us and being able to remember things. And so you forget to think, put something on your calendar. Oh man, I forgot to, I forgot to go there, right? I forgot to, to tell her to, to get the eggs from the grocery store. And it's because I did not, uh, because of the smartphones that we're using. We're putting too much emphasis on smartphones and putting the dates and times into those smartphones. And it's causing a decline in our perspective memory. So we have to be really cognizant of that. Um, and in order to rebuild our perspective memory, we have to be, we have to be building, right? So you got to work your grit, you have to work your brain, work your memory, um, practice remembering things uh, that need to be done in the future, okay? So it says, Jalanta has an appointment tomorrow. When deciding what time she needs to leave, she decides to avoid the route where traffic is always backed up. Which type of memory system is Jalanta using as she decides what time to leave, okay? That would be considered for semantic, right? This is just general knowledge, right? She doesn't, um, this pre previous learned that, you know, you go down that road at a particular time of day that you're going to run into traffic. And so I don't want to run into traffic. So I uh, I avoid that situation because of my semantic memory. OK. All right. So we're going to end right there. We'll stop right there. And uh, uh, that is chapter. That is the chapter right there. And so chapter seven, um, chapter eight will be cognition and intelligence and uh, and we'll see you then. Have a good one.